Hey, I'm Dan, and if you're new to homebrewing, so am I. Welcome to my adventures in homebrewing. Hey everybody, it's Dan, and welcome back to my adventures in homebrewing. Thank you very much for joining us. Joining us this week, I need to say thank you to Zach Weinberg for being on the show. Uh, Toronto Brewing Homebrew Supply Store is fantastic. Again, like I said, check them out. Their customer service is fantastic, and they are more than willing to help you out and take the time and make sure that you get what the proper ingredients or the proper equipment that you need uh, for what from talking to them talk to these guys they're all either mead cider or beer makers so you're in good hands so this week like i've been saying we're very fortunate to have back this wonderful gentleman we have horst dornbush back with us uh he is in my opinion an extreme wealth of knowledge in all things german beer um go check out his uh his i believe there's two websites right uh Cervesia, uh com right. and servicia is of course the latin word for beer yep and then you also have another one a horse dornbush just one word my name horse dornbush.com right so you check can this, find me there there you go so check this gentleman out again wealth of knowledge uh he's put out some books he's been a brewer he's been he's owned a brewery uh now he's is a consultant in the brewing world Horst, how are we doing this week, man? Uh, did we lose your audio? No, nope, you didn't lose my audio. Okay, so I'm wonderful. just saying. Well, greetings to Canada, uh, one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, I always love to visit Canada, and uh, right now I'm doing fine. Uh, we've got some rain outside, and uh, that's a very welcome change from the super heat wave from which we suffered in the last couple of days. So. Um, everything is fine at this end uh, of the world. Fantastic. So uh, like we were talking about yesterday, I think we're going to be talking about one of my favorite beers today. It's one, of, in my opinion, one of the best beers to have on a really hot summer day, which is the Berliner Weisse. The Berliner Weisse, yes. <laughs> I hope I said it right, because normally I have people... You are say, very close. It's okay. <laughs> I have so remember many... Kennedy said, Ich bin ein Berliner. And that mean, it really means I'm a jelly donut. You know that. <laughs> you have to say, not ich bin ein Berliner, but ich bin, uh, um, ich bin Berliner. You leave out the definite article, uh, the indefinite article. So uh, then you have a Berliner. But if you say ein Berliner, Berliner is also a jelly donut. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not a, I, I like jelly donuts but i'm not a jelly donut <laughs> so um yeah so berliner the berliner visa is one of my favorite beers and um i guess uh the reason why i like it so much it's not so much over the top sour as most of the sour beers are now like say like uh, traditional sour beers or kettle sours and things like that mm -hmm. it's actually more it's more of a balanced sour to tart ratio i find right. and it's so gently hopped that it gives more to the flavor than it does bitter uh, that's correct, yes. Uh, and it's, of course, a very old beer style, and nobody quite knows where it originated. There are several crazy theories. One theory says the Huguenots, when they fled France under Louis XIV, brought the beer style to Berlin, but there is no real evidence of that. Other people believe that Bohemian immigrants uh, moved to Berlin and brought a sour wheat beer style with them. But again, there is very little evidence of that. My personal favorite is that it is an outgrowth of a beer called Breuhan beer, which is a sour beer that evolved in Hanover. Um, and it, which in turn is an outgrowth of the Keute beer, which was a medieval barley and wheat brew that was slightly sour and was probably the most common beer in the late Middle Ages in the lowlands of Northwestern Europe. So I, it's very, to me, it's almost a natural supposition that that is the true origin of this beer. It's kind of weird that there's really no set defined lineage um, for this beer, but 
some of the things that um we were talking about yesterday is like how um you were telling me how it they were served and how they were made so i know today nowadays like when i make mine it's uh it's 50 50 with uh the malt so to so much wheat to i use pilsner malt so it's very very light um and then i use um Lullaman's uh wild uh wild brew philly sour uh lactobacillus in yeast pitch but you're telling me that that things were a little more different when they were initially made <clears throat> well um obviously there 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 are different types of sournesses if we can use a plural for that word of different character and quality um and obviously in the old days during open uh, fermentation, wild fermentation, if you wish, um, what you got into your brew were basically ambient airborne microbes, including brewer yeast, but also all kinds of bacteria, such of the lactobacillus and pediococcus variety, and sometimes also a little bit of retanomyces. So it depends on where you are and what your natural ambient microbial uh, 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 environment is. Um, there was <clears throat> a professor of what is now the VLB in Berlin, the Ruhr University, Professor Delberg, who in the 1930s managed to isolate the microbes that create that specific Berliner Weiss of taste and he discovered a lactobacillus type that had either to, uh, previously not been known. And it since then um, carries his name. It's lactobacillus delbrookii after Professor Delbrook, who subsequently in the 1930s emigrated from Germany to the United States and eventually uh, became a Nobel Prize laureate I believe in medicine. So he is a very illustrious chap, but in the early days, he ran the Institute for the fermentation trade. That's what the Institute was called in those days. And he discovered Lactobacillus delbrucki. And to the best of my understanding, um, you, can you can now purchase Berliner Weisse, um, microbial mixtures. Uh, I know that White Labs produces one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Y Yeast produces a specific um, Delbrookii preparation, and there are probably many others. But if you don't get the one with a specific uh, microbe that is ambient and existent in Berlin, your flavor will be slightly off. And it may taste more like a Flanders red or a Lambic, which is kind of not what you want in an authentic Berliner no. Weisse. Um, and of course, in terms of the um, yeast uh, portion of the fermentation, um, I would recommend a very, very neutral, clean fermenting German ale yeast, such as an Altbier yeast, uh, and I like to use um, Y yeast 1007, uh, which mates very well with Lactobacillus delbrucki. So, okay. <clears throat> so, um, with that, we were also talking about this, like there were there were some other ways to sour, make a sour with uh, <laughs> with other other things. Because I think you mentioned there was. <laughs> You're laughing at me because you know where I'm not going. Where I'm going with this, but <laughs> yes. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about putting like full fat yogurt into beer to okay. sour it. Yeah, I'm not, not gonna. Cooking. Not gonna go there. <laughs> but not you, we're okay. not gonna go there. Uh, but you did mention about acidulated malt. How we could use that? Uh, the what? Sorry, Ac acidulated. Ah, okay. Now, obviously, in the old days, open fermentation, um, you got what you got. And if you're in Berlin, chances are you had Lactobacillus delbrucki, a whole bunch of other microbes, maybe some pediococcus, and with any any luck, you had a nice ale, 
uh, nice bottom, uh, top fermenting yeast in the mix as well. Mm -hmm. That was very simple. You just wait, right? Um, nowadays, of course, we don't do that anymore. <clears throat> so one way of souring the beer, and it's not with Lactobacillus del Brucki, but just with straight Lactobacillus, is to put up to maybe 10% of acidulated malt into the mash. And uh, that even conforms to the German beer purity law because in nature, um, barley always, uh, it is always a host to Lactobacillus as well. So it is a totally natural process. Um, that's one way of doing it. <clears throat> Another way of doing it is, of course, uh, you make uh, your wort, you store it in the kettle, and then you add your souring agent into the kettle, let it sour, boil the, ke uh, boil the wort to kill the bacteria, um, and then that way you don't infect anything in terms of bottling equipment or fermentation right. equipment down the road because it's sterile. Now, the other way of doing it is, of course, you pitch yeast in the fermenter. And I recommend you pitch the yeast first and wait a couple of days before you pitch the bacterial culture, because that allows the yeast to get a head start and produce enough alcohol. Otherwise, the voracious, uh, the voracious uh, uh, bacterium might um, take too much sugar away from the yeast and you may not get an alcohol level that's desirable. And with uh, Berliner Weisse, uh, it, they used to make a lot of different types of Berliner Weisse up to maybe 7% alcohol. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, most of them are between 3 and 4% alcohol. So that's what you would be striving for. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's one of the things I really enjoy about them is that they're they're very light alcohol beers. And during the summer when it's hot, that's kind of the thing that I gravitate to because I enjoy something that's just, you're able to sit back, relax and have. But um, one thing that we were talking about yesterday is that it, the IBUs on them are, are, is extremely low. It's anywhere, I think we, we talked anywhere from three, no more than eight. On... That's correct. Yeah. Uh, when I, uh, I've made Avelina uh, Weiss a couple of times and I always calculated for roughly five uh, IBUs. Uh, and in terms of the selection, of course, um, <clears throat> because we are talking about a traditional beer style, I would use only some of the central European land races, that mm -hmm. is Saatz, Herzbrock or Spalt, Hallertauer Mittelfrü, um, Tettnanger, and perhaps the Alsatian Strisselspalt. These are all very low IBU uh, very low bittering hops, but they have a low alpha acid level, but they have a lot of wonderful aromas. So yes. that is uh, kind of what you want in uh, a Berlina Weisser. So I would yeah. for that. Yeah, that's what I use uh, the Tatanger. I, I know I'm butchering that name. I, I, I know I can't say it right. I am so sorry. You but, are, what, say that again? Tatanger uh, or? Tetnanger? Yeah, Tetnanger. Tetnanger. That's, okay. That, that's that's the one I use when I make mine. And I find that it's not overpowering. It, it gives great aroma and also adds to the flavor. But yes. touching on... And, hang on. And genetically, yeah. it's related to Saats. Oh, really? Yes. It's a, it's a Saats variety that has migrated gradually um, westward. And huh. Spalt, Hersbrucker, Strüsselspalt, and Tettnanger are Saatz derivatives that have adapted to their new local environment, whereas oh. Hallertauer Mittelfrü has nothing to do genetically with Saatz. So if the ones other than um, Hallertau are related to Saatz, can you other tower is not related to yeah so i'm saying it's but not all the others are all the others are yeah um could can you use saws and one of the others in a combination in the beer or is it better just to go with one 
No, you can use any combination. You can take a mixture of all five or six or whatever. Oh. Just stay away from the citrus notes or the, right. the heavy um, <clears throat> sort of woody, mushroomy type North Pacific Northwest hops. They would be, um, they would create too much of a signature in that beer and it would destroy the delicate tartness that you're looking for. Right. Now, touching on, we were talking a little bit about uh, flavor there a second ago, and I was going to ask that or bring this up because we also touched on this yesterday when we were when we were just chatting is um when i do my version of a berlin device is that once i'm sure it's pretty much done fermenting i'll transfer <laughs> on top of say a pure a pureed fruit like raspberries and you were telling me there was not necessarily the traditional way of doing it there's other mm-hmm. ways and then you also mentioned that there was some other things that people had used to, to flavor it. You like, cause you were saying the, you asked if you want green or red when you're in, mm-hmm. when you're in Berlin. So can we touch on that a little bit? Sure. Now here's the trick. If you're adding fruit, when, whenever you add fruit to a ferment and the ferment agent yeast or bacteria is still active and uh, alive, then of course, these microbes will start consuming the fruit sugars, Mm -hmm. uh, the fructose in your fruit, which contributes to alcohol and takes away any sweetness. So you're getting the raspberry flavor, but no sweetness, which is kind of what is desired in a modern Berliner Weisse. so that in, in a lambic, for instance, obviously you get the really strong, sour and tart comp, uh, 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 acidic uh, uh, mouthfeel, the mouth puckering almost mm-hmm. sensation. And of course, in a lambic, you add the fruit directly. You create a framboise, uh, a fraise and all that, a pêche and so on. Um, but in a Berliner Weisse, they try not to do that. However, there is... Uh, one large brewery left in Berlin that still makes a, a com- big commercial Berliner Weisse is the Schultheis Brewery. They do what you do. They basically add fruit to the ferment, but then immediately they, they filter it and pasteurize it so that hmm. any live yeast is eliminated. And so they can keep some of the fruit sugars in the liquid um, and you have to pasteurize it of course to to neutralize to kill basically the microbes um, that to me does not taste like a real Berliner Weisse um, you can purchase in Berlin at least and pr- it's hard to find on this continent but in Berlin you can also f- purchase unflavored um, Berliner Weisse um, usually made with about 40 to 50 percent malted wheat Mm -hmm. and that makes it different from let's say a wheat beer which is made with unmalted wheat or a belgian lambic for instance which may contain malted wheat so the berliners use malted wheat um, and the um the flavoring the the sweetness that you would like to have to counterbalance some of the tartness comes from syrups so the Berliners make a sugar syrup from uh, um, a raspberry flavored sugar syrup. Okay. And that's red. And then they also make another sugar syrup from a, and I, I, I looked that up and I wrote it down for you, um, from a, um, a ground cover plant, a leafy plant, that grows in very well in Germany at the edges of forests. It's called Woodruff. Um, in English, in German, it's called Waldmeister, which means forest master. Um, okay. Okay. And in English, we call that Woodruff. You take the, the greenish leaves of that plant and you create an extract or an essence from that, which you use in a syrup. And I, I looked it up and the um, 
the perfumey component in that plant is called coumarin, C-O-U-M-A-R-I-N. So uh, I, I couldn't remember the chemical name yesterday right. when we talked, but so I looked it up. Um, and originally the Germans used that plant to flavor a punch of young wine, white wine. Okay. Which is very tart. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, they call it a May bowl, a May bowl. It's a punch made with mm -hmm. uh, relatively young, slightly tart, and very dry white wine. They add strawberries to it, wood rough. And if you really want to splurge, they add a bottle of champagne to it. <laughs> that's, that's where it comes from. And All right. it is. And, and it is this plant that has, or the flavor, this flavoring has migrated from the wine bowl to the chalice of the, the Berliner Weisse chalice. Mm -hmm. and so at a, when you order a, a Berliner Weisse in Berlin, you say, I want a red, or you say, I want a green. And the server knows that when you say green, you want a chalice of cool Berliner Weisse beer with a little shot, maybe 50 milliliters in a one third liter bottle, uh, 50 milliliters of Woodruff flavored sugar syrup. That's and, cool. Uh, it's conventional for ladies who lunch in the summer in a street cafe in Berlin to sip their Berliner Weisse out, out of the ch chalice with a straw. <laughs> and that is kind of, we, we would consider that unusual, but that is the custom in Berlin. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> so one thing I didn't get a chance to ask yesterday, mainly sure. because like I have a bit of a squirrel head because I get distracted easily. Um, but why do uh, Berliners use chalices for their Berliner Weisse? Is it, is it to help, um, open the beer up to the so people get more of the aroma is it more to open up the actual body so it tastes better this is one of the things i'm always curious about that's interesting i have never researched any what the reason might be but i could give you a hype I, I could speculate if i may yeah, sure um you know that when napoleon basically defeated the prussians uh what was it, 1805 or something like that? Yep. Um, he occupied Berlin. And that's where he got his first taste of Berliner Weisse. Mm -hmm. And he called it Le Champagne du Nord, the Champagne of the North. Yep. And as you know, the real Berliners call it the Champagne of the working class because there were 700 breweries in Berlin making Berliner Weisse. All right. So it was really the local of um, um, the working stiff. Okay. Um, and sometimes you, some people drink champagne, not out of a flute, but out of a chalice, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where it comes from. Maybe there is some kind of an association between a, ch a chalice and a noble beverage. I don't know if that's the yeah. source, but... <laughs> I do not know. I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you stumped me. It's not too often I get to do that to somebody. <laughs> uh, this is one of those things that I'm always curious about what a glass actually does to, to beers. Because I know like some of them are supposedly they um, hold in certain aromas or certain flavors due to their design. So I'm always curious to know why that glass is, was paired with that beer. So it, it's just out of cute, plain curiosity. And it, uh, I guess it's kind of like an OCD thing with me that I always need to find out why, but I guess I have how a project. About, how about when it's served with a straw, you can use the straw as a stirrer and it's much easier yeah. to distribute the sugary syrup evenly in the liquid then it would be the case if you had, let's say, a Kölsch glass, which is very narrow and tall, or a Pils glass, 
um, it would be heart or how about a scotch thistle for scotch ale um, it would be harder to get the syrup to be dispersed evenly yeah. I, I have no idea but that is a, hypo, a possible explanation that makes to me that makes a lot of sense <laughs> that makes a lot of sense so um are there any other types of syrups that people use in Berlin devices that might not be so traditional? Um, yes, you do find cassis, uh, in other words, um, a black currant syrup as yep. well. I've seen that. Um, and of course, uh, as a home brewer, you can be as creative as you wish, and you can use anything, almost literally anything, mm -hmm. I wouldn't okay. use pickle juice, but <laughs> oh god, no! Because I, I mean, you know, because <laughs> I was I was thinking about just making a plain Berliner, and I don't know if you ever heard of the stuff called Ribena. It's a black currant um, kind of like syrup that you can get, and you would mix it with water, and it becomes like a black currant, or it's like a black currant concentrate, I should say, and okay. you uh, and you, and you'd mix it with water or or soda water, and you have a sparkling drink. And you can mix that, I guess, also with Berlina Weisse. That's what I was thinking. I was yes. thinking of. Yes. All right. And, and by the way, yesterday we mentioned um, <clears throat> the Woodruff syrup and the source of the syrup. Yes. Um, there, there is one brand that I know, at least in the United States, it's available by mail order. Mm -hmm. And I'm not promoting anybody, but you can probably find you can find it on the internet. Um, the German brand name for the Woodruff syrup is Centis. Z E N T I S. That company, I believe they're located in Cologne. That's sort of the predominant Woodruff syrup maker in Germany. Okay. Centis. And uh, you should be able to find Woodruff's, Woodruff syrup. Uh, uh, by mail order, even in Canada, I would imagine. Okay. I, I don't think I asked this. And I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not. And if you did, please tell me, because like I said, That's okay. my, my mind wanders at times. Oh, we should I, be glad we have one. <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, the, what is the flavor of Woodruff? What is the what? Flavor of Woodruff. Hmm, that's a difficult one to um to pin down it's it's a ground cover as i said it grows along the forest and and it's also known as sweet woodruff um so it is perfumey um it is slightly astringent and uh, is a hint almost of mowed grass if that makes any sense mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. so in a, in a in a in a weird way, you could say it's almost like a hop substitute, oh. because you know there are grassy hops, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. And they're perfumey hops, um, and they're hops that are slightly sweetish. They have there's like a a hint of sweetness in the hops. So. Uh, and especially the, the the aromatic German noble hops, they they are of that ilk, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the kind of flavor contribution you get from Woodruff. That's interesting that you mentioned that, um, like hop water, because that's kind of the a big thing right now. Is like in a lot of places, instead of making say like uh, hard seltzers and things like that, they're actually making hop water like they'll like they'll infuse yes. water with the flavor of the hop so they maybe do. maybe uh they got the idea to do that from berlin advice where they were using woodruff and said well we don't want to use woodruff but you have all these great different flavors of hops well why don't we try that and see what happens it kind of makes Perhaps sense there is a regional component to this um uh, maybe a regional and historical component because hop is a very finicky plant it you know, 40% of the world's hops grows in the Hallertau, 40% yeah. in, <clears throat> in Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, and the, the remaining 20% in a handful of countries scattered around the world, including Australia, New Zealand, Slovenia, mm -hmm. Czech Republic, Poland, Belgium, and the UK. 
I hope I got them all now. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, in Berlin, it would be next to impossible to grow hops. And if you can't grow, remember in the old days, people flavored before hops. Um, hop came into use <clears throat> in beer very slowly in the monasteries in the ninth and 10th century. Mm -hmm. And it became the dominant flavor in the 13th and 14th century in Central Europe. <clears throat> before that, they made Groot beer. In other words, a beer flavored with a mixture of herbs. And depending on the location, those herbs were very different. It could be um, mugwort, it could be rosemary, could be any sort of uh, uh, herb that was right. popular in your neighborhood, as long as it wasn't poisonous. So in Berlin, you couldn't grow hops. Thus, right. you would grow, make a Groot beer, and maybe the just as hops became dominant as in the Groot mix and eventually became the only flavoring in beer in other parts of Europe, in Berlin maybe um, Woodruff became the dominant portion of the Groot mix and eventually became the only one. That is, I mean, who knows, but yeah. you know, these things evolve over centuries very slowly. That is all before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, internet. <laughs> it, you either love it or hate it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else uh, about a Berliner Weisse that you think people might want to know? Um, well, it is very refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what else can we say about it? Uh, <clears throat> if you're adding a little bit of Cara Foam, Cara Hell, uh, Cara Pills, something like a very pale caramel malt, mm -hmm. you're getting added body which gives you a bit of an effervescent creamy head. Um, also, if your mash schedule is such that you basically skip the protease temperature range, you get more proteins into the beer, which means you get a nice creamy white head on top of your chalice mm -hmm. that looks very attractive and it enhances the mouthfeel. Okay. Um, one thing you, you mentioned that you said there was like at one point in time, almost I think 700 breweries in, yes. in making Berliner Weisse. That is correct. So it was strangely, you know, this happens very often that uh, a beer style becomes extremely popular and then tastes change and the beers and, and, and the style fades away. Um, you know, the, the English mild at one point was extremely popular and then it faded away and now it's sort of gradually coming back. back. Yeah. Um, you know, right now IPAs are the rage, but I bet you in 20, 30 years, they may have, a, they may take a much smaller place in the overall spectrum. Um, taste change, sour beers, um, see, sour beers were the norm in the past mm -hmm. because we couldn't, con we did not have controlled fermentation. So you couldn't control your microbes. So basically all beers were sour and also they were slightly smoky because you used direct fired kilns, right? Yep. So, and also use floor malting, which is, you know, you, you germinate on the floor. Mm -hmm. which means um, your malts were all under modified. That means they had a lot more unconverted large chain protein, uh, protein molecules, uh, uh, which means um, the, the, the mouthfeel and the body was probably much more substantial than it is today. So the, the, to me, it would probably be more authentic um, to have a richer mouthfeel instead of the total dryness that you sometimes find in sour beers. So you have a, a little bit of a proteinous chewiness, mm -hmm. the tartness, 
uh, a gentle hop arom the gentle hop aromatics from German noble hops. Um, and if you if you control your microbes, you get that uh, that Lactobacillus delbrucki rather than uh, um, um, a um, <laughs> a Flanders Flanders sour red uh, yeah. uh, 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 microbe preparation. Um, and if you get your your Woodruff, uh, then you're in for a unique taste experience, um, and it's fun to do. Um, Last time I had you on the show, um, you had mentioned, because we were talking alt beer, and again, it's another one of my most favorite beers out there, mm -hmm. that you could go in, a, in the region where people make it, and it varies from from town to town or from brewery to brewery. Mm -hmm. and, you were, and you said that it was the same thing with Kolsch. Is that the same thing with the Berliner Weiser? Um. <clears throat> Because nobody has tasted the beers that were made two or three hundred years ago, um, obviously we do not know if there is sort of the evolution of a house yeast or a house flavor that uh, you know um, that the brewer breweries uh, um, basically sold. Um, so that I I don't think we have an answer to that question. Um, the um, um, <clears throat> I, I go to Berlin occasionally, and uh, I was actually totally disappointed the first time I went there and tried to drink a Berliner Weisse because I was served that commercial product from the Schulteis company, which, um, and then I sort of investigated a bit because I have friends in Berlin who are in the industry, and so I learned how that commercial Berliner Weisse was made, and it really has nothing to do with the traditional methods, which, uh, as you know, I speak German, so mm -hmm. I can read all the old books and it's accessible to me. So the modern Berliner Weisse, the commercially available one, has nothing to do with the old brewing method. So um, <clears throat> I would imagine that um, the vets in which the beers were kept um, were um, um, different from one brewery to the next. Mm -hmm. I should also mention a little funny thing. Okay. <clears throat> because Berliner Weisse is highly effervescent, in the old days, of course, you might run the risk of exploding bottles. Ah, bottle bombs. Those are always fun. <laughs> And you know, in the old days, they had earthenware crocks. Yep. And they had stoppers and string or wire to hold the stoppers in place. Mm -hmm. So what the brewers did, they they lined up the bottles one ne next to the other in a cellar, and then they covered the bottles with sand. Okay. And Brandenburg, by the way, is called the sandbox of Germany because the soil there is very sandy. Okay. From the old ice age and the deposits and all that. Right. Right. Uh, which is ideal for growing potatoes and cucumbers, by the way. Yes. The <laughs> uh, and not hops and not barley. No. no. Anyway. So if the bottles did not explode. If the bottles did explode, the sand would absorb the shards and the pressure. Oh. So it was a safe way of testing whether or not the bottles would hold the pressure. If That's they didn't. So when you sold your Berliner Weisse, you simply dug up the bottles and you left behind the broken ones. Huh, that, that, that's actually pretty ingenious when you think about it. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 but nowadays we can measure, you know, oh, yeah. we can measure everything and know uh, whether or not we reach our terminal gravity and all that. We, we, we are now uh, uh, sort of, we have science to look into this more carefully. Um, oh, but that I, was the old way of doing it. Oh, gosh. Uh, I remember um, way back in the day at one point, um, a grandfather making beer at home. He was doing his version of the Pabst Blue Ribbon. 
and he was using cake yeast. So he was like, okay, a little here, a little here, a little here, a little here. And then he'd cap everything, whatever else. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me, but okay. And all of a sudden, at uh, some point in the evening, all you hear is kabang, 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 kabang. It <laughs> was like bottle bomb hell in the basement, <laughs> just going off. And you like, you have friends come over sometimes and you, and he said, what's that? Oh, <laughs> someone's making beer. Oh, okay. And all of a sudden you hear, bang, what the hell's going on? Oh, don't worry. It's just the beer bottles exploding. <laughs> so do, do you have sand in ottawa <laughs> oh we have clay it was it oh, that's uh, it's, right clay soil yes yeah we have right. a lot of clay here so um yeah, yeah the clay would the clay would can, would work it would work <laughs> if you dug a deep enough hole um i mean i was adventurous at one point in time where i was getting told don't bottle condition in growlers don't 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 it's a bad yeah, idea that is that yeah. is um, uh, well, I, I, I kind of did it anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. and, it, and it worked. It worked. So basically, I was very cautious though. I put, yeah. uh, I have um, a couple of buckets I used to use for fermenting and one fits inside the other. So I put one inside the other, then I put its lid on top of it. And I put a pot, on, like a big canning pot on top of that. So like, if anything is going to go boom, it's going to be contained. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Yes. Now, the other thing, um, you might, what was it? Um, um, where was I? I was just thinking of another item and that is, now the German beer purity law says that a wheat beer needs to have at least 50% um, wheat malt. Yeah. The Berliner Weisse in that sense, does not conform to the purity law because it's nowadays brewed with less than 50%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other interesting part is um, when you select your yeast, do not use Bavarian wheat beer yeast. Okay. That, because that's... that one has phenolic and banana oh. that they are produced as fermentation byproducts by that particular yeast strain. Right. Uh, and you know, the name of, it's the four vinyl gracol, that is the cloviness, and it's the isoamyl acetate, which is the banana flavor. If you use a Bavarian wheat beer yeast, even though Weiss beer and Berliner Weisse sounds very similar, they're not. You are making a mistake. Um, use a clean tasting, clean fermenting uh, German ale yeast, a, an Altbier yeast, or a Kölsch yeast. I have never tried to make Berliner Weisse with lager yeast, so I don't know if that works mm -hmm. or what, what would come of it. But again, if you're a home brewer, that would be an interesting, to just interesting uh, experiment to play around with. Yeah, one thing I mentioned to you yesterday is that uh, I have friends th that own and run Escarpment Laboratories, which is a yeast producer in mm -hmm. uh, Guelph, Ontario, and they do have a series of yeasts uh, for Berliner Weisse. And I would mention this to you, mm -hmm. where er everything's all included all in all one package, just like the Lullaman's Wild Philly Sour sure. Brew. So I'm going to be doing my version of the Berliner uh, this weekend. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm going to try that yeast out and see how it is. It, it's called Berliner Brett 2. And, and, and I'm it, surprised that you say Brett because to me, the Saccharomyces Brettanomyces is really a flavor that is kind of alien to the typical Berliner Weisse taste. Yeah. I'm really surprised. Right? Well, because it, in reading it, it says that the, no, no matter what type of sour um kind of beer that you have or when you do it there's always some form of brett there according to what the, these guys are microbiologists so i gotta be scientists mm -hmm. so i'm i've got a feeling well if it's that minimal i've got a feeling it won't be as predominant as say the lactose bacillus with its tartness and everything else so it's it's gonna be an interesting experiment this week and to see how it goes and mm -hmm. I'll keep you. I'll keep you in the loop. 
and let you know how That's it goes. Interesting. Uh, does the package list the components? That um, I because it's a mix, you say. I actually have it. I have it on my wall. All the yeasts they make, I have it on my wall. So if you give me a sec, okay. I, I'll. Oh, you got a phone ringing. So give me a second. Oh, I'll find let it. it ring. Let it ring. Let All, right. It ring. <laughs> All right. Just give me a sec. All right. Here we go. So according to to these guys here at over at Escarpment Laboratories, it's Bretomyces bruxellinus uh, from an old bottle of Schlusslis Berliner Weisse, funkier than Berliner One, with peach notes, pear, and pineapple. So it's. Um... Bretonomyces brucellensis. Bretonomyces brucellensis is one of them. Yep. Yeah. Well, that is really okay. So obviously they're they're in business, right? Yep. So obviously they say, here is our product. You can use it for Alembic, for um, Flanders red ale. You can use it for Berliner Weisse. Uh, you can throw it into a porter and get some funkiness in there or whatever. Um, but you see, if you want to be authentic, I recommend you research the source for Lactobacillus del Brucchi. Okay, and also there is that, that that as I said, the Berliner Weisse mix available from White Labs. Yeah. Oh God, damn phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's and awesome <laughs> it's what shall we call it the bane of fame yep <laughs> it's the <laughs> the penalty you, oh. you, you pay when they know you <laughs> it's and all it's good like, man i wish <laughs> i had your problems <laughs> <laughs> Once you get to be my age, you approach, you appreciate the, the lack of problems more. <laughs> <laughs> Horst, thank you very much for being on the show this week. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and I always learn with you. Thank well, you. We can always do this again. Absolutely. Folks, okay. again, check out Horst on at horstthornbush.com, at cerveciacommunications.com. Uh, I believe he does have a Facebook page and a few other social media uh, platforms that he uses. So please check him out. Uh, he is a wealth of knowledge. He was a co-editor with Garrett Oliver on the Oxford's book, uh, to, uh, to, beer, to, yeah. to beer was a it's a fantastic read honestly a lot, <laughs> there's lots of information in it go check them out uh another thing guys just so you know the 17th of uh, of this month which is july i'm gonna be doing a live show with the guys from the brew tubers so if you get a chance please join us and listen in uh if you have any questions for these fine gentlemen please fire them off and again Horst, thank you very much for being on the show. We will be we'll, we'll be in touch. Uh, I, I might just have the phone give pick up the phone and call you just so I can be one of those people let's, on the let's phone. Do something silly. <laughs> Hello. Listen, I'm on a Zoom call right now, and there we I'm go. Busy, so get off my phone. <laughs> Again, horse, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for coming along for the ride. A beer or two along the way. I'm Dan, and I'll see you on the other <laughs> side. Okay, bye, Ken.